Before Shaun of the Dead, before Ghostbusters, before Young Frankenstein, before even the Monsters, there was one method for blending comedy and horror that reigned supreme. Just throw in those guys who keep getting confused about baseball player names. Take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I am not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. Yes, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello made several comedic horror movies. Their blend of fast-paced wordplay and elegantly choreographed physical comedy finally honed over years on vaudeville and radio. The radio was more the wordplay than the physical comedy, but you know what I mean. This blend was the perfect bit of silliness to put up against a spooky backdrop. It helped that they were under contract at Universal, allowing many of their parodies to double as official crossovers. So now I'm going to rank Abbott and Costello's horror movies! At least the ones that I consider to be their official horror movies. There's actually some debate over which ones actually count. I might have missed one that you would include, let me know in the comments. But this is what I consider to be Bud and Lou's horror canon, and here's my ranking. Welcome to the D List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. Number six, Abbott and Costello meet the killer, comma, Boris Karloff. Bud plays hotel detective Casey Edwards and Lou plays bellboy Freddie Phillips, both working at the Lost Caverns Resort. When Freddie discovers the murdered body of criminal attorney Amos Strickland, he's suspect number one, even though nearly everyone in the hotel has a motive, including Boris Karloff as Swami Talper, because white America sure loves being scared of them weird mystical foreigners. The Swami and the other clients of the late attorney agree that no matter who actually did it, it's best to let Freddy take the fall. So they try to get him to sign a confession and kill himself. But hilarity gets in the way. Meanwhile, more and more bodies keep piling up, and Casey and Freddy go to length after length to hide them until they can clear Freddy's name. Freddy lies about still having a handkerchief from the scene of the crime that could lead to the identity of the killer, leading him to become the next potential victim. So he sets Home Alone-style booby traps around his room until he's summoned by the killer for a meeting in the caverns. Give me the handkerchief and I'll save your life. You see my life, and I'll give you the handkerchief. No. I'll save you. Could have been serious. This was fast tracked after the success of Meet Frankenstein, reworking a script written for Bob Hope, and turning a female mystic character into a Swami for Karloff to play. They also brought back Lenore Aubert from Meet Frankenstein as another femme fatale who puts the moves on Lou for ulterior motives. Gee, you're pretty. I bet you say that to all the girls. Yes. It don't go over so good with the boys. Yeah, Hollywood's pretty much always been about trying to replicate things that worked once already. And we gotta get Karloff's name in the title because of the association with Frankenstein. That is, if Karloff's name actually is in the title. Based on the promotional material, the title does seem to be Abbott and Costello Meet the Killer, comma, Boris Karloff. But from the title screen on the film itself, it appears to be Abbott and Costello Meet the Killer, and then it just flashes Boris Karloff's credit quickly. But most people refer to the movie with Karloff's name in the title, and if it is in the title, this is to date the only major Hollywood motion picture to feature three actors' names in the title. Of course, that'll all change as soon as I sell my hot screenplay for Aubrey Plaza and Alice and Brie and Adam Scott go to Burning Man. Also, spoiler alert, but Karloff's character isn't the killer. He tries to get Freddy to kill himself, but he doesn't actually kill anyone in this story. So I guess Abbott and Costello meet the killer, comma, Boris Karloff isn't saying Abbott and Costello meet the killer named Boris Karloff. It's Abbott and Costello meet the killer and also Boris Karloff. It's a New York Times headline. <laughs> Boris doesn't really have much of a presence in the back half of the movie, so marketing it around him probably felt like a bit of a bait and switch at the time. Also, this one is barely a horror movie. It's kind of a suspense movie, I guess, and there's some supernatural-ish elements whenever the Swami has Freddy under his spell, but really it's just a murder mystery. It still deserves to be included in their horror canon because of the Karloff of it all, and again, because it was greenlit to cash in on Meet Frankenstein specifically, but even if it was a horror movie, it wouldn't be one of their best. 
it's not even their best murder mystery movie. It does feature a staple of their horror movies, a Lou tries to show Bud the dead body, but it keeps disappearing sequence. All right, all right, so you messed up the bed. What about it? Go and relax. No, he was here. Oh, Milford. Uh, Milford. Uh, no, no, no. Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that Milford's body was there and it's gone? Uh, Take care of yourself. Take it easy. Take it. But it feels perfunctory because it comes after Bud actually does see several dead bodies. He's dead. He's been stabbed. These scenes always hit harder when Bud legitimately doesn't know that there's any reason to be scared. Here, Bud's already been scared, so him telling Lou that there's nothing to be scared of is just too unreasonable. I am getting sick and tired of this nonsense of yours. He was there. Oh, don't tell me that. Milford was there. Milford was there. Milford was there. How could he be? The man is dead. For a dead man, he's sure getting around. Bud and Lou's characters also don't really have a lot to do with solving the case other than being bait for the killer, but it is because of Lou's comedic actions that the killer is ultimately stopped, and I do always love in these movies when the narrative climax is caused by a punchline. That's probably the one area where this movie improves on me, Frankenstein, but we'll get to that later. Without all those booby traps, we could have never solved this murder. Thank you ever so much. Overall, this movie is elevated by two standout sequences. The aforementioned Swami trying to kill Freddy scene, because watching Karloff play Lou Straight Man is quite entertaining. Do you have the gun, Freddy? Then don't delay. Put it to your head and use it. No, no, no. And the playing bridge with corpses scene, which actually got the film banned in Denmark for a while. Oh, no, you don't. No, that's peeking. Oh, he's always cheating. But aside from those two sequences, it's a pretty unremarkable entry in the Bud and Lou canon. <laughs> Number five. Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Bud and Lou are the ever so creatively named Slim and Tubby, two American police officers working in London on some sort of student exchange program, I guess. They get caught up in the chaos of a brawl at a suffragette rally, so they get fired by the inspector, played by Reginald Denny, who has had a long and illustrious career, but I mostly know him as Commodore Schmidlap. <laughs> Slim and Tubby try to get back on the force by capturing the monster responsible for all the mysterious murders. Meanwhile, one of the suffragettes, Vicki Edwards, is falling in love with a reporter named Bruce Adams, much to the chagrin of her guardian, Dr. Henry Jekyll, played by Boris Karloff in his second outing with Bud and Lou. Jekyll is in love with Vicki, which is, um, weird and creepy, and he transforms into Mr. Hyde, played by uncredited stuntman Eddie Parker. <laughs> Unlike the other movies where Bud and Lou meet pre-existing monsters, Universal's only Jekyll and Hyde movie before this predates their monster franchise as we know it now. Like it predates the Lon Chaney Hunchback and Phantom. It's a silent short. And it's public domain. Maybe that should be next year's Halloween riff. So rather than transplant the monster into Bud and Lou's world, this film is actually a period piece purporting to be this world's version of the Jekyll and Hyde story as we know it, just with Bud and Lou shenaniganing it up. So I guess you could argue about whether or not this fits in the Universal Monsters franchise, but let's not pretend that's a particularly tightly overseen canon. As a Jekyll and Hyde story, it's uh, a little odd that this version has Jekyll willfully becoming Mr. Hyde in order to commit evil. Like, he becomes Hyde because he wants to do bad things that he just can't do as Jekyll alone. I feel like a lot of looser adaptations of Jekyll and Hyde go with this version, but, you know, it's, it's not really the story as it was originally written. Mr. Hyde will kill him. Mr. Hyde will kill him. Then I guess neither are the Bud and Lou shenanigans, so, eh, that's not really worth holding against this film. Coming! Coming! Something you may note throughout all of these movies is that there are two main ways they play the blending of fear and laughs. Either we see Lou's character scared, and his reactions are over the top and funny but still relatable, and tension comes from Bud not seeing what Lou sees. He's got a bodyguard downstairs like the chairman apart. Where did this take place? Where did it take place? Right behind there. Oh, that's a bookcase. Yeah, that's a bookcase. And behind a bookcase, he's got a laboratory with all kinds of funny animals down there and things. Or we see Lou in a situation where he doesn't notice the monster, and the tension comes from how oblivious Lou is to the danger around him. At their 
best, these movies know when to go back and forth between these two modes, allowing us to have both empathetic laughs at a character's fear, and fearful laughs for a character who doesn't know he should be scared. This movie's sneaking around scared sequences aren't as elegantly crafted as ones in other movies, but they serve as a good taste of a flavor we love. I've heard Abbott and Costello fans criticize this one for going too hard on slapstick and too light on wordplay, and I can't disagree with that, but my bigger issue is how removed from the main plot Bud and Lou are for most of it. Or rather, how removed from Bud and Lou the Jekyll and Hyde story is. Tubby was right. You're capable of doing everything he said you did. Like, it's mostly just Bud and Lou doing shtick, occasionally encountering Mr. Hyde, and then there's also a story going on that they only tenuously intersect with. Jekyll's creepy assistant, Batley, interacts with Lou about as much as Mr. Hyde does. And then the sequences take you all over London with varying levels of entertainment value. Of course, the action ends up at a music hall for an excuse for some song and dance numbers. But the most interesting part of the sequence is an appearance from a young, uncredited Henry Corden, who would go on to take over the role of Fred Flintstone after Alan Reed. Excuse my friend, he's a little excited. Excited? He's bombing. I shall call the manager. Then the action goes into a House of Horrors wax museum with a wax Dracula and wax Frankenstein monster. Which, depending on how much you're enjoying the movie at this point, is either a fun callback or a reminder that you've seen this all done better before. There's some fun Bud and Lou get to have with the Jekyll and Hyde premise when Lou briefly turns into a mouse, immediately clearly played by Lou's stunt double, and then later Lou turns into a Mr. Hyde of his own, leading Bud on a wild goose chase, but narratively this mostly just gets Bud and Lou out of the way so the bland, handsome leading man can defeat Mr. Hyde. But apparently Mr. Hydeism is transferable via bite like a werewolf, so that's something. <laughs> I will give this movie some credit, especially for the time, for having a leading lady who's a suffragette, but not like a straw feminist caricature. The movie as a whole isn't beyond the occasional, ugh, women, am I right, jokes, but not at Vicky's expense. You kissed me. What's wrong with that? I told you I believe in equal rights. She wants equal rights for women, and she wants Bruce, and at no point do we see her give up one for the other. That seems pretty basic, and yet it's something comedians and screenwriters decades after the fact had trouble reconciling. <laughs> there's suffragettes and there's a chimney sweep gag. Are we sure this isn't Mary Poppins? <laughs> Number four, Hold That Ghost. Bud and Lou play gas station attendants who are also part of a temp waiter service for high-class nightclubs, don't question it, named Chuck Murray and Ferdy Jones. They're servicing the vehicle of a gangster named Moose Matson because I just can't get away from gangsters named Matson, apparently. But then the police spot Matson. there's a car chase with Chuck and Ferdy in the car, Moose gets killed, and per his will, the distrusting gangster left his belongings not to anybody specific who could betray him, but to the people physically closest to him when he died because I guess he was trusting enough to assume those people wouldn't be the people who killed him. So they inherit the Foresters Club, and they end up stranded there in a storm with Dr. Jackson, Camille, and Norma. And this secret speakeasy appears to be haunted. Shenanigans ensue. But the haunting was all just various gangs trying to scare them away to get Moose's money. So in this one, the supernatural element is not real. Although they never explain that floating candle. It's sort of... This went into production under the name O. Charlie as Bud and Lou's third movie, after their supporting role in One Night in the Tropics and their starring role in Buck Privates. While this was in production, Buck Privates came out and was an unexpected smash hit. Test audiences for the first cut of this film wanted it to be more like Buck Privates, complaining that the Andrews sisters didn't show up this time. So the film was put on hold while another film was fast-tracked to be more like Buck Privates, in the Navy. Then work resumed on O Charlie, renamed Hold That Ghost, 
and the nightclub scenes were added at the beginning and the end just to shoehorn the Andrews sisters in there, and also to give Ted Lewis a chance to bore everyone with somewhat racist numbers. Critics love the movie, but not the nightclub scenes. Sometimes test audiences don't actually know what they want. That's it. Come on, Gib. Get out! The boss! The boss! You're both fired! Make a roll job at the gas station! Despite the shoehorn musical numbers, this established how much fun it could be to put Bud and Lou in spooky situations and it set the tone for the horror movies to follow. Although the later ones dropped the it was all a trick thing that makes this feel more like a proto Scooby-Doo episode. What am I talking about? This is nothing like Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo has Freddy Jones. This has Ferdy Jones, and he's much more of a shaggy type. Oh, the romance between Richard Carlson as the dorky Dr. Jackson and Evelyn Ankers as Norma isn't the least interesting romantic subplot between two non-comic relief characters in a Bud and Lou film. There's some fun to be had with Evelyn trying to get the oblivious and tone-deaf doctor to open up, but it also feels like it would have been more fun fleshed out in a different movie. The hijinks kind of stop most of the time, it's just the two of them on screen together. But I do like how as soon as sparks start to fly between the two of them, they're suddenly completely oblivious to the threat around them. The spark between Lou and Joan Davis as Camille is a lot more fun, and while it only toys with being a full-fledged romance, their comedic chemistry is off the charts. Joan Davis should have been in a lot more Bud and Lou movies. She fits in perfectly. <laughs> Mr. Jones, are, are you a married man? No. Well, neither am I. <laughs> He's old enough, ain't he? Oh, yes. There's also a cameo from a common collaborator of Bud and Lou's at this time, the once in future stooge, Shemp Howard. He's not given much to do, but he's there. I have just poured a glass of your orange juice down the drain. I squeezed the fresh batch an hour ago. And it is now exact... Is that the right time? Overall, the movie is mostly an excuse to put Bud and Lou routines in the context of familiar haunted house tropes, and it's a solid go at that, but it paved the way for even better things to come. <laughs> Number three, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Okay, okay, I know. You expected this to be number one, didn't you? Ranking it any lower than that makes you question the legitimacy of my entire list. I get it. And I love this movie, I really do. This is probably the best monster movie out of all of these, but I'm an Abbott and Costello fan before I'm a monster fan, and while this is a very good use of the duo, it still feels more like a monster movie guest starring Abbott and Costello than the other way around. Bud and Lou play Chick Young, not the Blondie creator, and Wilbur Gray, checking packages arriving in Florida. Wilbur's suspiciously attractive girlfriend, Lenore Aubert as Dr. Sandra Mornay, comes in to check on them around the same time they're tasked with delivering packages to a tourist trap operator named McDougal. He has ordered the original remains of Dracula and the original Frankenstein monster. But Lawrence Talbot tries to warn them not to deliver those packages. But his Wolfman curse strikes before he can get the warnings out. When Dracula and the monster escape, Chick and Wilbur are arrested, but bailed out by Jane Randolph as Joan Raymond, which really sounds like they named the character after the actor, but the character was originally written with Dorothy Hart in mind, so unless they renamed the character, it's strictly a coincidence. Raymond is an insurance investigator, trying to find out what Chick and Wilbur did with the packages, so she puts the moves on Wilbur. Meanwhile, we find out that Sandra has only been with Wilbur because she wants his brain for Dracula to put in Frankenstein's monster, so... Literally nobody is actually into Wilbur. Poor guy. Talbot tries to get Chick and Wilbur to stop Dracula, but being a wolfman makes things difficult. He attacks McDougal, and McDougal thinks it was Chick. Also, Professor Stevens is there as the handsome bland guy. Hello, Dr. Leos. I've been looking for you all day. Look, it's an all-time classic. It defined the subgenre of horror comedy for decades, so it's funny how little the cast wanted to do it. Lou thought the script was terrible and was only convinced to do it with a major pay advance and the hiring of Charles Barton as director. Lon Chaney Jr. blamed the film for the death of the monster franchise, saying it caused audiences to stop taking the monster seriously, even though, let's be real, most of the audience was already having trouble doing so. And Boris Karloff denied the offer to return as the monster because he thought mixing comedy and horror would make for a surefire flop. So the role of the monster was given to Glenn Strange, who had played the role in two earlier monster mashups, but Boris Karloff was asked to be involved in the film's promotion, and he said yes, as long as he didn't have to see the movie. 
Of course, when the film turned out to be a big hit, Karloff changed his tune and worked with Bud and Lou twice after, but we've already discussed that. Honestly, he should have been in this one instead. It would have been better off for him. You didn't see me. You didn't see me. You didn't see me. I wasn't here. Obviously, it was groundbreaking for Bud and Lou, too. We wouldn't even be doing this list if this film hadn't been a big enough hit to launch a mini-franchise. And while I think it's unfair to say that this killed the Universal Monsters franchise, this does mark the final appearance of Dracula, Wolfman, and the monster in the original timeline. The next film Universal would make with that particular trio would be Van Helsing. And I don't think it's this movie's fault that audiences didn't take that one seriously either. Why is it so important to kill this Dracula anyway? Because he's the son of the devil. I mean besides that. Because if we kill him, anything bitten by him or created by him will also die. I mean besides that. So it's possible that these really are the canonical final deaths of the original Universal Monsters. Even though they've been resurrected after deaths that felt much more final than this before, but hey. I guess if all the recent Horror Nights mazes are canon, then, you know, they came back to do whatever happens in those stories. Oh, hey, buddy. But that does lead to my biggest disappointment with this movie. The monsters are all stopped by either each other or the boring straight man characters, and not by the actions of Bud and Lou's characters. Their contribution at the climax is basically escaping the plot rather than solving the plot. Lou is more of a MacGuffin than a protagonist. Everyone is after his brain, but the narrative actions are mostly driven by Dracula and Talbot. Which again, is fine as a monster movie guest starring Abbott and Costello, but not very narratively satisfying as an Abbott and Costello movie guest starring the monsters. <laughs> Still, the final punchline of the movie is strong enough to leave me on a positive note, even with Bud and Lou's lessened agency in the climax. Now that we've seen the last of Dracula, the wolf man and the monster, there's nobody to frighten us anymore. Oh, that's too bad. I was hoping to get in on the excitement. Who said that? Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the invisible man. <laughs> <laughs> Now, while this isn't the only Universal movie to feature both Dracula and the Wolfman, it apparently was the first one where they exchanged any dialogue. So, we meet again, Count Dracula. Dracula? Yes, that's who he says you are. Oh, my costume, perhaps. This was also only Bela Lugosi's second time playing Dracula on the big screen, and it would end up being the final major studio film he made before he transitioned into working with Ed Wood or meeting Brooklyn Gorillas. Interesting. Really think so? What a charming And yes, many a nitpicker has pointed out, Abbott and Costello never meet Frankenstein in this. They only meet Frankenstein's monster. Well, technically, Abbott and Costello don't meet anyone. Chick Young and Wilbur Gray meet Frankenstein's monster. Also, if we're going off the title card in the film itself, there's no and in the title. It's just Bud Abbott, Lou Costello meet Frankenstein. Look, we don't need to give this title crap when we already dealt with Meet the Killer, comma, Boris Karloff. But let's be real. The title, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, isn't a description of the plot. It's literally an elevator pitch in title form. The script was originally called The Brain of Frankenstein, but Universal was concerned audiences wouldn't figure out it was a comedy. But putting the names of your biggest comedy stars in the title, that'll make it clear. It's Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein in the wackiest mashup of all. And it works so well, they use the title format for just so many Bud and Lou movies going forward. Not only meeting monsters, but also joining the Foreign Legion and meeting the Keystone Cops and going to Mars, in which they never actually go to Mars, so spare me your Meet Frankenstein nitpicks. Oh, and also, speaking of the opening titles, they were done by Walter Lance, so that's fun. <laughs> The sequence where Dracula awakens is an all-timer, a perfect escalation of hold that ghost's moving candle bit. It perfectly encapsulates how the humor of Bud and Lou and the scares of the monsters can complement each other. Lou's doing all his usual funny reacting, but it only makes it scarier because it's happening to one of America's favorite symbols of innocence. If this sequence is topped at all, it's only by the sequence when Lou is in Talbot's room, oblivious that the Wolfman is about to strike. 
Again, the two ways of blending fear and laughs. Either having us laugh and scream with Lou's fear, or having us laugh and scream at the danger he doesn't know he's in. Both perfect uses of tension for both horror and comedy. I left your bag in the bedroom. Wilbur. The film borrows a lot of the same hooks as Hold That Ghost, but amplifies them with real monsters and a castle full of secret passages instead of a mere inn. But Lou desperately trying to show Bud something scary that Bud doesn't get to see works in any setting. As long as it wasn't upstaged earlier in the movie by Bud actually seeing the scary thing. I'm getting sick and tired of the silly nonsense of yours. Some guy going around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, another guy going. Uh, yeah. No, no. The one guy is cool. I don't know for a fact, but I feel like that scene might have been a direct influence on this scene. <laughs> what is that? What about yours? Hey? Eh? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. You know, far too often Abbott and Costello's dynamic gets reduced to Bud is smart and Lou is dumb, but it's more complicated than that. I mean, if Bud was so smart, he should be able to figure out why the names of the players on the team are so confusing to Lou. No, no, what is on... Oh, I see what your problem is. <laughs> Lou tends to display a childlike level of intelligence, but more situational awareness than Bud. If anything, Lou is reacting like a normal person based on the level of information he has, which admittedly may include taking things a little too literally and drawing from a limited vocabulary, but usually his internal logic is unassailable. You know, people pay McDougal cash to come in here and get scared. I'm cheating them. I'm getting scared for nothing. Meanwhile, Bud will either be actively gaslighting Lou to screw him over, or his myopia keeps him oblivious to what's really going on around him, and all he can do is vent his frustrations on Lou. Bud's the straight man not because he's actually any smarter or more logical, just because he's more stoic. His only emotional reaction is enacting physical violence like real adult men. Come on, chick. Be just like you used to be. God, go away with it. Had a boy, I'm happy. So a simple but effective way for these movies to establish that things are getting real is having Bud start to get scared. Ah, finally, you know what's going on too, huh? Finally, you're as smart as Lou is. Before I ever saw this movie, before I saw any Abbott and Costello movie in its entirety, my family was flipping through the channels in a hotel room and landed on the compilation feature World of Abbott and Costello, which includes scenes from this movie. And this shot gave me nightmares for roughly a month or so. From then on, any hotel room bed headboard could be a door that a Frankenstein could come out of. Chick, do you believe me now? Yes. So yes, this movie is a double genre-defining classic. But as someone who is more invested in one of those genres than the other, there are two other movies that give me just a little more of what I want. Number two, Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. Bud Abbott and Lou Costello play Bud Abbott and Lou Costello for the first time since their first film role in One Night at the Tropics. Although the credits seem to think they play Pete Patterson and Freddie Franklin. But no, they bring their universal film careers full circle and play Abbott and Costello for their final film at the studio. They overhear Dr. Zoomer talking about the mummy Claris, not to be confused with Karis from the last handful of Universal Mummy movies, and how he needs assistance to transport the mummy back to America. But also overhearing are the followers of Claris, led by Richard Deacon? Really? Huh. And an unscrupulous woman named Madame Rontru who wants to steal the treasure that the mummy guards. So when Bud and Lou go to Dr. Zoomer's house to apply for the job, they find him already murdered. Lou takes pictures to anonymously tip off the police, but with Bud in the pictures, he's the prime suspect. Finally, Bud's frame for murder instead of Lou, it only took your whole film careers. Meanwhile, Lou accidentally eats the sacred medallion that leads to the treasure, which means once again an unscrupulous beautiful woman is throwing herself at him to get what she needs. These films really did love reusing a handful of tropes, didn't they? So the followers of Claris and the henchmen of Madame Rontru keep trying to use each other to get what they want, and Bud and Lou are stuck in the middle of it all. Eventually, the mummy does stuff. He's also played by Eddie Parker. 
Also, there's a Peggy King musical number, I guess, because we're really trying to throw back to the Hold That Ghost era. You came a long way from St. Louis. You climbed the ladder of success. Out of all of these, this is the film that integrates Bud and Lou best into the plot. There's no bland, handsome leading man to be the actual protagonist. There's no character from the original monster story to take charge. Bud and Lou are center stage. Buddy, my boy, if you find a fellow who killed Dr. Zoomer, you got the murderer. Hey, you've got something there. What makes you so dumb? On the other hand, while Bud and Lou are well integrated, this may be the one that gives the least screen time to the titular monster, who is an off-screen MacGuffin for much of the film and only has about eight minutes of actual screen time. So, yeah, people are going to say I'm ranking this one too highly, but again, Bud and Lou fan first. It's moving. Is it now? Also, like with most mummy movies, if you're going to enjoy this, you're going to have to do some compartmentalizing because you're going to have to get past all the white westerners playing Egyptians. Yeah, when I want to cast the high priest of an ancient religion protecting the legacy of an ancient mummy, of course I'm going to go with Mel Cooley. Dude can't even keep Buddy Sorrell in check. How's he going to lead an ancient civilization? Yeah. <laughs> and let's face it, the way things pardon the mummy pun, but wrap up here isn't particularly great. Bud being suspected of murder is just kind of dropped halfway through when the police get the real killer off camera. And while I love everything culminating in three mummies, the actual defeat of the mummy and the reveal of the treasure is uh, anticlimactic. Dynamite! Dynamite! And the happy ending being letting the Western capitalists turn your cultural heritage site into a tourist attraction feels like it could be really funny if it was taking a more satirical eye to the idea than I'm pretty sure it is. But I guess ending with opening a nightclub really brings it full circle to hold that ghost. Wise guy, eh? But up until then, this feels a lot more cohesive than most of the earlier movies do. Even the random musical number in the middle is short enough to not be as distracting as Ted Lewis. You got a long way to go. I also think this has the best Lou tries to show Bud the dead body sequence. The places the body gets hidden are a little more creative than we've seen in the past. And the scene of Bud and Lou trying to saddle each other with the cursed medallion is top-notch. Lou pulling a wabbit season on Bud is immensely satisfying, even if it only helps him for a brief second. And we do get a brief taste of a scaled-down who's on first. How can, how can a shovel be the pick? Look, if I'd have wanted to pick, I'd have picked the pick. But instead, I picked the shovel because the shovel is my pick. Oh, in other words, you don't want to pick the pick because the pick is a pick and the shovel isn't a pick. If you pick the pick, the pick, the shovel isn't a pick. Now you've got it. Now I got it. I don't even know what I'm talking about. It may peter out in the end, and it may have all the baggage mummy movies always have, but the bulk of the film is a fine culmination of Bud and Lou's film careers at Universal. And my number one favorite Abbott and Costello horror movie, Abbott and Costello Meet the Invisible Man. Bud Abbott and Lou Costello play Bud Alexander and Lou Francis, which were actually their middle names, so that's neat. They're private detectives who are hired by Tommy Nelson, a boxer who escapes from jail after being framed for murder, because apparently most of these monster movies have to be about being framed for murder. In an attempt to catch the real killer, Nelson wants his fiancé's uncle to inject him with invisibility serum. Nelson injects himself with the serum and assists Lou in going undercover as a boxer to find the real killer but everyone's concerned about the effect the serum is having on Nelson's sanity. And yes, once again, a beautiful femme fatale is throwing herself at Lou for ulterior motives. Don't talk. That light on your profile, it shows your iron will, your rugged individuality, your indomitable courage. Reportedly, this script was originally written as a straight entry in the Invisible Man series, but the story was reworked into a Bud and Lou comedy, which... Probably wasn't that hard to do. There's a lot of potential for laughs in the Invisible Man premise. And maybe this movie doesn't milk all of them, but it's still probably the best integration out of all of these monster movies of the monster's traits into the humor. Like, Dracula crossing paths with the boys didn't give way to a myriad of bat transformation gags, just 
generic scared guy meets scary guy humor. The Mr. Hyde potion led to some shenanigans, but they were tenuously connected at best to whatever that movie's story was. But invisibility leads to so many beautiful bits of slapstick, with people on the sidelines reacting with fantastic comic double takes. The first scene with Lou and the psychiatrist is absolute perfection. Do you always see things? Only when my eyes are open. And have you ever seen anyone disappear before? Yes, sir. My brother. Uh-huh. This may have been the start of this complex, seeing things. Tell me about it. Well, my brother and I, we were walking down the street, all of a sudden, he disappeared. Into thin air? No, into a manhole. And it leads into an equally perfect running gag. I saw a car with nobody driving somebody. There's just so many great invisibility gags throughout. Plus, this movie teased an accidental spaghetti kiss before Lady and the Tramp. Of course, they were too cowardly to go all the way with it. And like all the best Invisible Man movies, the disappearing effects hold up reasonably well. The handshake disappearance impresses me to this day. Also, the Invisible Man in this movie seemingly has no relation to the Invisible Man cameo at the end of Meet Frankenstein, despite this being the next proper monster movie after that, since Meet the Killer, Boris Karloff is, well, Meet the Killer, Boris Karloff. That one was the unmistakable voice of an uncredited Vincent Price possibly reprising his role from The Invisible Man Returns. This one sounds more like the fake Vincent Price from Return to the Batcave. No one can touch me. Not even the cops. That makes me a nemesis. Batman can't save you now. <laughs> I know a lot of people rank this lower in the monster pantheon because this is the only Abbott and Costello horror movie where the titular monster is an ally to button loose characters instead of a threat but there's still risk of him becoming a threat if he thinks they've crossed him. Listen, you two. If either of you ever cross me again, I'll break every bone in your bodies. Tommy, I didn't do anything. Don't give me excuses. Get in the car. Okay. Yes, sir. Not in the front, not back. Even more so, he's a threat to himself. There's still opportunity for chills, even if the titular monster isn't a bad guy. I feel like that's pretty in keeping with the tone of the Invisible Man movies thus far. Invisibility gives me a sense of power for good or for evil. Tell me that, that feeling of power, it might be a symptom. Speaking of which, this is also one of the very few Universal Invisible Man movies that don't involve any relative of Claude Rains character Jack Griffin, although Dr. Gray acknowledges him as the creator of the invisibility formula. You want to be shot down like a mad dog as he was? He never regained his visibility until he was dead. When he willed me this formula, I swore I'd never use it until I'd found some safe reagent. Some means of bringing a man back in time. But you know what I love about this movie is all the sitcom royalty. William Frawley plays a cop just a few months before the world would come to know him as Fred Mertz. His annoyance with Bud and Lou gives him a chance to do the type of stuff he did best. You again? I knew you'd do something like this. What did I tell you? Take me to the station. Are you going to see that nice man again? Yes, and I'm going to have my head examined. And the main villainous gangster is, let's face it, the go-to actor for gangsters in the era, Sheldon Leonard. Modern audiences probably recognize his face as Nick the Bartender in It's a Wonderful Life, but you may also know his name from going on to be Danny Thomas's producing partner. Producing not only Danny's sitcom, but also The Andy Griffith Show, The Dick Van Dyke Show, Gomer Pyle, USMC. The man is such a sitcom legend that it's no wonder one of the longest running sitcoms of the century named their main characters after him. Who's talking? Tommy Nelson. And I'm taking you to the cops to tell how you framed me. Not as long as this gun is in my hand. So yeah, this movie cast its future sitcom royalty way more appropriately than Meet the Mummy did. I drank so much I don't remember seeing anybody. We're even. We didn't even see you. I'll admit it, this might not be the best monster movie out of all of these, but I think it's the best integration of a monster and that monster's traits into a solid Abbott and Costello movie. And as a comedy guy first, that's what I want. I want Bud and Lou at their best, and the monsters to just add texture, like the humans in a Muppet movie. That's just like you. You get everything backwards. Come on. And that's my ranking of Bud Abbott and Lou Costello's scary movies. But which one is your favorite? 
Would you even count Hold That Ghost or Meet the Killer? Should I have counted The Time of Their Lives, where Lou plays a revolutionary war ghost? Should I have counted that TV special they did where they did a sketch with the creature from the Black Lagoon? Let's discuss this all in the comments, and until next time, this is Dave, signing off.